Oh, I feel like we can give her another round of applause. <laughs> Melinda. So we're gonna do something a little bit different. Uh, instead of a sermon, because we had the water communion ceremony, we're gonna just have two short reflections on water from two different perspectives. The first from me and the second from Floyd. The words of Rabindagath Tagore, Rabindranath Tagore. The same stream of life that runs through my veins night and day runs through the world and dances in rhythmic measures. It is the same life that is rocked in the ocean cradle of birth and of death in ebb and in flow. We begin with a ancient wisdom tale, a good story. Once upon a time, a young person was sent on this great, great journey. They left the sacred mountain of the Holy One on a search to discover the one thing that is most valued by the Holy One, the spirit of love and mystery, which some people call God. The young person searched and searched over many years all over the earth. They brought many things back to that mountain, drops of blood from a dying patriot who struggled for the freedom of all people, some coins that a destitute widow had given to someone who struggled more than she, dust from the shoes of a medical worker in a far-off land, the young searcher brought these to the gates of the holy mountain, but they were told they hadn't found the one thing that is most valued by the holy one. One day, the young person saw a small child playing by a town fountain. A small child, not unlike some of the children we saw this morning in our water communion. A weary king rode up on horseback and dismounted to take a drink in the fountain. The weary king saw that young child and suddenly remembered his own childhood innocence. He felt a pang of sadness. Then, looking into the fountain, he was shocked to see the reflection of his own face, hardened by war and worry wizened by the weight of responsibility. And worst of all, he saw his eyes were drained of any compassion. The king realized how he had let life's lessons harden him. And he felt the loss of all the people he once loved and who had loved him and were no more. Tears welled up in his eyes and began to trickle down his cheeks. The young searcher reached out and took one of the tears. They carried that tear back to the sacred mountain and were finally received with joy and love. They had found what the Holy One valued most, tears shed in love and in memory. When I was little, I remember my father telling me not to cry, teaching me that it wasn't manly to show anybody I was hurting. It was better to prove that I was stronger than any challenge. But who among us hasn't felt the waters of pain, the waters of parting? In the Jewish religion, religious tradition, our tears are honored. Pain is honored. Loss is honored as a sacred part of being human. In his book, Love and Death, Forrest Church, a Unitarian Universalist minister, wrote, the Israel Museum in Jerusalem contains a collection of tiny ceramic cups. These were sacramental vessels. People cried 
into them. Your mother just died. Someone you love has cancer. Your spouse has left you. You're struggling at work. So you pick up your tear cup, put it under your eye, and weep into it. When you're finished weeping, you cap it and you put it away again. It's a way to save your tears because they are precious. Your tears are precious. It doesn't matter why you cried. Your tears are precious. For they show that you care. A cup full of tears is proof that you have felt deeply, suffered, and survived. Forest Church continues, life is difficult. Some people pretend that it is not, that we should be able to just breeze right through it. The best way to protect ourselves from tears is to avoid love or to love only in little ways so that when we hurt, we will only hurt in little ways, suffer loss in little ways. That was not the fashion among the ancient Hebrews. They were not afraid to cry. Their tears were sacraments of love which flowed from a deep spring. They wept into their cups of tears until they could truly say, my cup runneth over. Did you know that most of the water that exists in the world is at least 4.6 billion years old? That means that the tears we cry originated 4.6 billion years ago. Our tears carry within them 4.6 billion years of history. Where have the waters of our tears flowed through time? Were our tears once a wave crashing into the shores of ancient Cambodia or a ripple in the Nile River as it flowed past the newly constructed pyramids? Were our tears once waters carving the splendor of the Grand Canyon? How many endless cycles of evaporation and precipitation did our tears experience? Were they snow, rain, Fresno fog? Were our tears once blood pumping through the heart of a gray wolf in the high Sierras? or the spray of sea in a lo- as a long-ago blue whale breached in Morro Bay. I wonder who wept with the self-same water that now flows from our eyes. Perhaps our tears were once cried by Sojourner Truth as she was auctioned off at the slave market along with a flock of sheep for $100. Perhaps Our tears were once part of the uncountable tears wept for the 800,000 Americans who lost their lives in the flu pandemic of 1918-1919. Again, the words of Berbindrath Tagore, the same stream of life that runs through my veins night and day runs through the world and dances in rhythmic measures. It is the same life that is rocked in the ocean cradle of birth and of death, in ebb and in flow. What tears have we cried in the ebb and flow of our lives? What tears have we cried in this pandemic? What waters fill our tear cup? The words of Rabindranath Tagore, the same stream of life that runs through my veins night and day runs through the world and dances in rhythmic measures. 
I feel my limbs are made glorious by the touch of this world of life. And my pride is from the life throb of ages dancing in my blood at this moment. As a parent, I am a steward of young people sent on a great journey. And acknowledging that the flow of time and the sacred timeless waters that flow through that which we view as extraordinary, the sacred timeless waters that flow through that which we view as mundane, and everything in between will carry our children forward into a future of uncertainty. We surrender the beings most precious to us and entrust them to the principles we as Unitarian Universalists cherish and covenant with each other and our communities at large to uphold. Principles to affirm the inherent worth, dignity, and grace of others. Principles that help us see how we're always connected to all around us. In our faith, we strive not to deny ourselves, nor our children, one of humanity's most innate and precious tendencies, our shared sacrament of tears. We also hold fast in our faith that the beauty of life will reveal itself over and over again, and that our practice of our faith will attune ourselves and our children to hear the song of the spirit of life throughout our and their lives. In water, we see clearly the phenomenon of waves, a visualization of energy that we know courses through every facet of the physical universe. But in water, we're allowed to viscerally perceive this force in a unique way. I understand, and it's tempting to have fear that the river of life will carry my children into turbulence. But I also understand that turbulence dissipates, that inevitable rapids and waterfalls always give way to still and deep pools, and that every stream eventually joins with the infinitude of the vast ocean. And further, every molecule of water on land is liable to evaporate and join the clouds in the beautiful blue sky. To repeat the words of Rabindranath Tagore, the same stream of life that runs through my veins night and day runs through the world and dances in rhythmic measures. I feel my limbs are made glorious by the touch of this world of life, and my pride is from the life throb of ages dancing in my blood at this moment. This wisdom helps me see that we are put here to flow. It's in our nature. We're supposed to roll with the tides. We're supposed to let the stream of life carry us to places where we may remain for a period to be washed away and eventually carried away into the ether. Water has a certain eternal tenacity to continue its search for its ideal place to be. Is it on the snow-capped peak? Is it at the depths of the ocean? Is it in coursing through the ancient springs of Val Brabana in San Pellegrino, Italy? Is it being put to work in the smooth green glass of a bottle of San Pellegrino sparkling natural mineral water? Water still hasn't figured it out and it's not bothered by it. Maybe we shouldn't be either. How can we channel the optimism we're able to see reflected in water? We can take solace in the fact that the waters of this life will carry us and those we care for to where we're each supposed to be. We can find peace in the fact that we will join with the infinite waters of existence. Let our individual meditations flow through the rapids and pools of our shared experience as we sing, I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got strength like an ocean. I've got strength like an ocean. I've got strength like an ocean in my soul. Oh, I've got love like a fountain. I've got love like a fountain. I've got love like an ocean in my soul. Oh, I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river in my soul.